Hello friends, it's Steve from Southern Illinois again, enjoying a nice spring morning. Neighbors are out sitting in their front yards uh, or out on their four-wheelers, so we'll see how the noise is today. But I promised you a story from Africa. The knocking on the door woke me up about one o'clock in the morning. It was dark as only a place without electricity can be dark. The night watchman stood there with the flashlight illuminating the scene. I knew him well. He couldn't speak English well, but he was a good man. And if he was there at one o'clock, I was needed. He said, car, car hit man, come. Now, in my grogginess, I got things confused, and I had man hit car, and I had this image of a fist hitting a car, and why am I getting out of bed at 1 o'clock in the morning because somebody hit a car? But then it registered. We lived, the, the hospital was right next to a state highway, so we had cars traveling at high speeds, sharing the road with pedestrians and cows and yeah, pedestrian accidents were not uncommon. But at one o'clock in the morning? Who would be out on the road at one o'clock in the morning? Still, I got out of bed and I uh, got myself together and I headed over to the hospital. As I was walking down the path to the hospital, I was feeling overwhelmed, okay? I'm a family doctor. My only surgical skills are doing C-sections. Um, and uh, here I was going to face a case that, well, he needed a trauma surgeon. He needed an orthopedist. He might, might need a neurosurgeon. He needed a lot more than just the family doctor. And as I was walking down the path with these emotions going through my heart, I looked up at the stars and said, said God, what was I thinking when I thought I could come over here to Africa and help people? I mean, I am just totally unqualified for this. And there was that voice, that fully formed thought again. Steve, did I call you? Yes, Lord, you called me. Then that's the only qualification you need. Whoa. Whoa. Yeah, that that is so counterintuitive for me. I, I, I just, I just wanted to crumple right there, and I said, "Lord, okay, um, uh, I really need you to help me here because, um, yeah, you've got to come through tonight because I, I, I'm walking into a situation that I'm not, I'm not at all prepared for." I got to the hospital and. I noticed that outside there was a military vehicle. There was a military checkpoint a couple of miles from the hospital on the, on the state highway. Uh, soldiers were assigned out there for three to six month stints and their job was to suppress banditry on the road and that basically involved stopping every car that came along and deciding whether these people were legitimate or not. It was it was a thankless job and um, uncomfortable for them, especially at night, because at night, sorry, I just got dive bombed by a morning dove. So, at night, the soldiers had to stop the cars by standing in the middle of the road with a little flashlight, and they didn't change the batteries until they were totally gone. So they were standing in the road with this, waving this flashlight frantically back and forth with cars driving at them at 60 miles an hour. <laughs> oh, so that's what we mean by car hit man. When I opened the door to step into the hospital, chaos reigned. Nurses were shouting, soldiers were waving AK-47s in the air as they shouted at the nurses 
uh, it was a volatile situation. And I put on my best doctor take charge voice and I said, what's going on here? A soldier spun around towards me and his, his AK-47 whopped me in the chest. He was immediately yanked aside by his peers and the charge nurse was in front of me. This, this, this soldier was hit by a car at the checkpoint and he's got, he's got serious injuries and he needs to go to the university hospital uh, an hour away so that they can take care of him. But the soldiers refused to, t to have him go there. And one of the soldiers spoke up, no, we won't take him. If we take him there, he will die. And I turned to him and I said, why? Why do you think that? He said, because they're on strike. It takes two weeks before anyone is seen in the emergency room. I nodded in understanding. Strikes were, are common in many parts of the world, and they disrupt health care routinely. I said, let me examine him, and then we can talk about what, what, what would be best for us to do here. So they stood aside, and I did the history and physical exam with seven soldiers fully armed with AK-47s hovering over my shoulder. Now, if you don't think that's a nerve-wracking experience, then you've never been in it, okay? The soldier couldn't speak at all. As I examined him, his jaw was cocked over to one side. It was obviously dislocated, probably fractured from the degree of dislocation. I didn't have an x-ray machine, so I couldn't do an x-ray examining him, um, chest, lungs, his heart, he was breathing okay, he was awake. But when I got to his legs, I asked him to move his legs and his, his left hip started to flex to lift his leg. But as the leg went up, the upper leg bone bent in the middle. This is the knee, this is the hip. And his leg bone bent in the middle and with my, my hand was on it as he was lifting the leg and I could feel the bones grating together inside of his leg and even though he couldn't speak out of his mouth came this scream of pain <sighs> I turned to the soldiers and said okay here he's got a broken leg and his jaws dislocated and with the way he was hurt there's probably internal injuries as well I don't have an x-ray machine so I, I don't I, I can't check his jaw and I can't determine how badly the leg is broken but it's broken in the middle of that upper leg bone and the way to treat that is to put a metal rod in both ends and hold them in place like that you drill it in from one end hold it in place like that until it heals. I don't have an x-ray machine. I don't have a surgeon who can operate on the bones. I don't have the equipment or the metal sterile metal rods to put in there. That's all at the university hospital. They said, what can you do? <laughs> and I started scratching my head. Okay, I mean, racking my brain. How do you treat a femur fracture without surgery <clears throat> and I remembered reading an, reading an old text in medical school of how they used to treat that and you've seen pictures of traction where you know you put a weight and you pull the bone straight and hold it there like that so that's how we treated these 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 um, fractures these broken bones before we had sterile surgical techniques but it meant laying in bed with your foot your leg in traction for three to six months and even then the leg usually ended up shorter or bent so I told the soldiers all this and I said that's really not the way you want to go that's not the way he wants to go um, they said but there's nothing else we can do. So the upshot of it was that we admitted him to our hospital despite the fact that we didn't have the 
equipment to take care of him. And I set about trying to build a traction device to try to keep the legs stable because if the bones wiggle back and forth they tear things up inside and cause bleeding and injury to blood vessels and nerves. But we didn't have any of that equipment either. So I asked the maintenance man for a pulley and he just looked at me blankly. A pulley. He hadn't heard that English word before. I tried to explain to it and the best we could come up with as a pulley was an old paint roller. Need a weight. We didn't even have a bucket that wasn't already in use, but somebody volunteered a calabash. That's a big gourd, um, about a foot and a half in diameter that's been cut in half. So it's a, a big bowl. So we filled the gourd with sand and tied it in a cradle, made a cradle of rope to hold it, put the rope over the paint roller as the pulley, and then put a bowline on the rope and put, put it around his leg and taped it in place. It was primitive, it was rudimentary. I had no idea how long it would hold up. But when we applied, applied the weight to his leg, he relaxed. A shot of morphine took care of the rest of the pain. And that was the best we could do for him. Primitive, rudimentary. And then seven soldiers with AK-47s and the nursing staff and I joined hands around his bed and prayed for him. Asked God to heal him. And that was all I could do. I went back to bed. In the morning I came to the hospital and the first thing in this hospital, this mission hospital, was there was a worship service for all of the staff and all of the patients and the patients' families. There were usually between oh, 30 and 50 people at work, morning worship. But I could tell something was up as worship was going on because the nurses kept looking each other at each other and smiling and whispering behind their hands. And, and as soon as worship was over, they, they came up to me and the charge nurse said, you need to go see the man in the men's ward now. I said, what? What happened? She said, you'll find out. And then she sparked at me. And it was like, it was so disconcerting. I, I, was, I was worried that something bad had happened and she was smirking at me. And yeah, so I rush over to the men's ward and as I round the corner to, to enter the ward, there is the soldier leaning up against the door of the ward smoking a cigarette. And I'm like, wait a minute. Wait a minute, get back in bed. And I motioned to the other soldiers who were still there, help him back into bed. They looked at me like I was crazy. And the soldier spun on his heel and walked across the room without a sign of a limp. And I'm like, no, this does not compute. He laid down in the bed and I examined him. His face was bruised, but his jaw was back in place. He could talk to me. He was moving it normally. He had no tenderness over... There was no sign of a fracture. I examined the rest of him, got to his leg, and he had a huge bruise on his leg, and, and there was a knot of muscle inside. It was tender to the touch. But it was not broken. When his commanding officer came in, thinking that he was going to have to make arrangements and pull strings to get his, his uh, uh, man uh, into the university hospital and treated, 
He was rather disgruntled with me for my misdiagnosis of the fractured leg. What do you do with stories like this? Okay? You know, I've told this story, story to doctors over the years since I came back. This happened 20 years ago. And they said, well, you know, physical diagnosis can be wrong. You, you didn't get an x-ray, so you really don't know that it was broken. Yeah, I, I can mistake a leg that bends where it shouldn't bend. I can mistake the feeling of bone grating on bone. But at the same time, you know, they are right. I have no physical evidence to hand them or you to prove that a miracle happened. I have the memory of my experience, the physical sensations, what I saw, I heard. I am an eyewitness. All you have is a story. So what do we do with stories like this in the lives of other people? Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, talked about how people reacted to his story. Remember, he was traveling and this bright light shone and God spoke to him and he was blind, blinded. And then after three days, somebody prayed for him and the blindness went away. And when he shared his story, he said, the Jews ask for a sign. They say, oh, if something supernatural happened then, prove it to us by having something supernatural happen now. Otherwise, we won't believe your story. There are Jews among us today, and I'm not saying that in a racial perspective. I'm saying that in terms of people who say, I won't believe unless it happens to me. Paul said, the Greeks seek after wisdom. The Greek word is Sophia, and it meant wisdom, intelligence, philosophy. The, the Greeks wanted a rational explanation that fit together cohesively with their worldview. We have Greeks among us today. I was one of them for a long time. Each of us is faced with a choice when we hear stories like this. What do we do with them? As I was studying this week, I looked at Paul's statement to the Corinthians and, and, and looked at what some of the commentators had said. and, and one of them said this, uh, A.R. Fawcett in his commentary had this to say, Christianity begins not with solving the intellectual difficulties, but with satisfying the heart that longs. What does your heart long for? Forgiveness? Strength for your weaknesses? a shelter from your fears, light for your darkness. Christianity doesn't argue with our imperfections and say, oh, it's not that you're imperfect, you're just unique. Christianity doesn't reframe our weakness as a personal strength or deny the reality of our fears Christianity acknowledges that this is the human experience. We experience ourselves as incomplete, as faced with situations that we are not qualified for. We are afraid. Christianity is not concerned with the intellectual problems of proof primarily. It provides us with evidence, but its 
critical focus is on the real life, boots on the grounds, here and now problems that we face in this full contact sport we call life. Ultimately, each of us has to come to a point of whether we are going to continue to demand proof before we accept help, or if we are going to accept help and let the evidence develop. Robert Frost, one of his favorite, one of the, his poems that's my favorites, goes this way. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair and per having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, but as to that, the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves that no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet, knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. Which road have you chosen to travel, my friends? The road I've traveled has been long, it's been circuitous. There have been amazing experiences on the, on the path. I can't go back and retrace those steps, and there are paths I have not walked down, so I can't claim to be an authority on this. But the paths I chose have made all the difference. Thank you for joining me again. Have a wonderful week. Be safe, be prudent, but above all, keep looking up.